Excellent. I'm really excited about this one. Oh, oh there we go. Face didn't quite match what you were saying, but the it words did. were there. <laughs> Welcome to the Cutting Room Podcast, brought to you by 7 Videos and me, Paul Sherwood. Each week we'll be cutting through the things that you want to know about video marketing. 7 Videos have been going for nearly 10 years now, and over that time we've had many achievements but also learnt a lot of things along the way. This podcast is an opportunity for us to share all that knowledge and all that experience with you. Each episode is going to focus on a different topic, concluding with our seven top tips that you can start to put into action in your business. As with all podcasts out there, you know the drill. If you think it's any good, don't forget to give us a follow and keep up to date on when the next episode drops. Here we go again. Episode nine we're at now of The Cutting Room. And this week we're going to be talking about how to create a successful video project. So a topic that I hope... We know pretty well. I'm Paul Sherwood, one of the founders from Seven Videos, and I am joined again by Jake, our producer. Jake, how are we doing? Excellent. I'm really excited about this one. Oh, oh there we go. Face didn't quite match what you were saying, but it the did. words were there. <laughs> and we're also invited, uh, uh, invited, delighted to be joined by Michael again, our customer success manager. Michael, how are we doing? I am delighted to be here. Thank you to be invited. Delighted to be invited. Yeah. Lovely to have you both on board. Right, so this week, uh, again, same rules apply. We're in uh, the new room. The walls are thin. You might hear a bit of banging and clanging, but we're just going to plough through it. So how to manage a successful video project? Who wants to start? Think, oh, both of you, by the looks of it. I was going to offer it, Jake. <laughs> no, I think, um, I mean, with any project or sort of thing that you're undertaking, you want to make sure that you plan uh, beforehand. And I think we will obviously get on to that, but in order to plan effectively, you need to establish what the objectives are for whatever you are doing, what problems you're looking to solve. And, and what success is going to look like. Um, so I think if you start at that point by defining the project's objectives, you can then start to be like, right, well, how are we going to achieve that? Mm, and what, what sort of objectives would you look to put in there? Say if you were looking to sort of to define something, what would you look to include? I think you'd start off by looking at, you know, what is the, the problem, if you like, that you're looking to, to solve. Um, obviously, if, if everything's absolutely perfect and, and you, you don't want to actually uh, improve on anything, then you wouldn't really bother um, with, with doing a video project. But uh, obviously that is not the case. It's also understanding as well um, what the business goals are and the business strategies are and making sure that whatever project you're doing, video project, is aligned with what that marketing plan is that's going to ultimately deliver uh, and make those strides towards the company's vision and, and long-term success. Yeah, definitely. And I think things that, well, questions we often ask are sort of, who are the audience, who's going to be watching the video as well? That's always a good thing to know. There's objectives on both sides. It's like, what do you want to achieve as a business, but what do you want the viewer to do or think as a result of the video? Yeah, because we have that project brief, which we send out at the start of every project. And I think it's just a really good way of getting a real outline for what someone's wanting from a project so it's always objective key messages target audience and call to action so like really simply you know why are we making this who's going to watch it what do we want to say to them and what do we want them to do as a result and i think if you've got those four key bits of information that gives you a starting point for any project but in particular a video project yeah it, it defines exactly what the project is and what it what it's about and it should be something that is black and white and you can refer to when you have any sort of creative decisions to make you should always have that to refer back to and if it's an effective project brief it should answer any questions that you do have and do you think you need to know sort of what style of video you want to start with or would that sort of come from the video brief in your i think it is largely led by what the objectives are you know if it's to you know, we, we've spoken about the attract, engage, delight model that we've that, um, we've referred to a few times, um, and that basically encompasses the different stages at which you're interacting with your potential customers. Are you looking to sort of engage interest from someone who's never heard of your company before? Are you looking to um, move someone from that 
attract stage to actually engaging with your company and, and looking to work with you? Um, or are you actually sort of providing value and information for existing clients? So those are th very different things and each has different styles of videos that, that work best. So it, that is essentially why it's important to define those objectives early on so that that can then prompt those decisions. Yeah, I think you've defined those objectives and it's understanding, like I say, what potentially, what the metrics of, of, of what success looks like because that's kind of the barometer of whether you've achieved those objectives, I guess. So what kind of, the, I know it's obviously also dependent on whether you're in that sort of attract uh, or delight stage, but what are we, what got some sort of key metrics that clients are usually looking at to, to define whether a, a project has been successful? Um. There's many different things and like you say, it really does depend on um, what those wider objectives are and what figure, if you like, would be an indication that, that those objectives have been met. So it could be if you're wanting to increase traffic to your website, um, you know, what is that kind of bounce rate that, that you're getting off the video, how many people have clicked through. Um, and w these are all things that you can track and, and it's you know very advisable to do so because you can then make decisions uh, for your next project based on what's worked well and what hasn't because you've got it there in the numbers. Yeah, it's good for your return on investment to know exactly sort of what's happened with that particular video, knowing who's, who's watched it, sort of the type of audience that's watched it, I guess sort of the who's watched the whole thing, who's dropped out, knowing where they've dropped out and that's all sort of really valuable for sort of feedback sessions and knowing how to build on that for sort of your next your next video next project certainly helps when justifying to sort of um, senior figures within your company you know uh, justifying the investment you you can say well we achieved that that goal this is the number that proves it yeah I think a lot of the time clients just want I think we noticed this when we went to sort of the, the trade shows it's sort of people want awareness people want to build brand awareness and if that's sort of just based on your, your viewing figures sort of knowing how many people actually viewed it that's a really good sort of metric for return on investment at that point. A great example of that is, you know, is a, a project we worked on that um, the client wanted to sell tickets to their attraction um, by putting on a TV advert. And we work a lot with um, a company, uh, Sky AdSmart, which basically is Sky's advertising arm and it's a very targeted um, way of advertising. So before the project starts, the client can define the demographics that they want to target that advert to, Sky, ensure that it reaches those people. But another thing that was really good that they did was they could attribute someone watching the advert on the TV to then a ticket sale. And they do that by IP addresses, various different means. But what that meant was that the client could then see exactly how much of their ticket sales were directly attributed to that advert that they'd invested in. And that was just a really clear way to demonstrate that it was worth the investment. And off the back of that, they have inquired about doing that again. So um, I think that really encompasses what we're talking about. Yeah, definitely. So we've defined what the objectives are. And we now, and then we know what the metrics of success look like. So we know where we're looking to get to. I guess next steps is to create a plan of how we're going to get there. Yeah, I mean, by this point, you've probably you've got to the point where you've you've understood the type of video that you want to create, the number of videos, and what needs to be in it, etc. And you can then start to make decisions on how the project's going to look and you know how quickly you can do it who needs to be involved and i think that's the point you need to start thinking about you need to start thinking about the project team that you're going to assemble you need to think about timelines when do you need it to be delivered by is there a certain point by which you need it to be live and you can work backwards from that i think that's always, always the, yeah it's always the most important point isn't it knowing, knowing when the deadline is so you can sort of build the project backwards um, knowing when you need to hit the, that sort of key dates, knowing who needs to be involved in those key dates, just so you can plan that. Yeah, and I think that does also raise a wider point of the type of project team that you are going to put together because those two points kind of go, they run parallel really when you're sort of planning. You need to know the availability and, and resources you have at your disposal. So the things you need to be thinking about uh, when assembling a project team is firstly from 
your side, who is it going to be that has the the final sign off? What skills do you have in house that you can utilize? That obviously mean that you don't have to invest, but where you where you lack in certain skills or, or equipment or whatever it is, you can then look to draw people in and, and understand where the investment goes. Um, obviously for us, we, we, the way we fit into most clients' plan is they bring us in to provide the professional video production element to it. Um, and off the back of that, sometimes we're working with um, script writers, um, animators, voiceover artists, whoever it may be that is required to achieve those goals that, that you've um, set out in your plan. Being clear on the budget as well, I think, at that point, um, because that will also dictate whether which bits you want to do in-house, which bits you want to outsource. And, you know, if you've got a two grand budget to do a video project, you're probably not going to spend 500 quid on a script writer, 500 quid on a voiceover artist and leave yourself with you know, half the, 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 the budget to do the production side of things because that probably wouldn't make much sense. Whereas you might be able to say, well, I can, you know, we're working with a two grand budget. I can probably knock together a first draft of a script. We, we, us as a video company can work with the client to sort of refine that. So that saves a few hundred quid. We might not go down the voiceover route and just go with sort of music and, and text on screen. Suddenly saves you. Suddenly saves yourself a grand. And you've got two grand there to work with. So it's all about understanding the budgets you got to play with, and I guess who needs to be involved in the project. Yeah, I think as part of that plan is sort of having those initial meetings and sort of discussing that sort of sort of showing everything as one whole thing and just working out what actually needs to go into it um, is really helpful. Yeah, and you want to have a blend as well of different skill sets. You know, I think. Across a project, you know, you need the creatives to come up, you know, that's kind of where, where we come in. The technical aspects, again, that's us from a production perspective, but if the subject matter is is technical, we need some form of subject matter expert involved from the client side, which historically in projects is maybe where things have, uh, we've had, we've stumbled across issues in the past where, you know, we've been responsible for the content for a, a, a medical you know, yeah. you know, a scientific, you know, provider of something. And yeah. there's a lot of words there that we don't understand. And we're like, mm, well, what does that mean? All those hours of you in casualty. Didn't really <laughs> come into play at that point. <laughs> but yeah, I think it, making sure you've got the right people in the right places at the right times, sort of at each, at each stage is always really, really handy. And it saves kind of any kind of pitfalls in the in the production value as well i think by looking ahead and thinking where do we need to sort of bring someone in or um source resources mm. you could end up falling into the trap of thinking that oh we'll just be able to do it all ourselves and you get to a point where it's like ah actually didn't think of that when and and by that point you're either going to cause delays to your project and your deadline because you're then having to go look out for people there and then and get them up to speed with the project. Whereas if you thought that at the beginning and you planned for it, you can get everyone involved in the project early doors, everyone's on the same page and it'll run a lot more smoothly. Yeah, I think there's definitely value in sort of putting work on other people's desks rather than sort of trying to do it all yourself, which as a bit of a control freak myself, it's a bit more difficult. But I think when you actually delegate things and you sort of giving it to the right people, you get a much better product at the end of it. Yeah, so going back to your point around sort of in-house resource and whatnot is that you know some companies we work with have got in-house resource to to edit a video, to shoot a video, but they may well be massively over um, subscribed within the business, and that they might take two months to turn something around. Whereas it's understanding, yeah, it might cost a little bit more for us to do the whole thing. You might have some resource in-house to do it. That doesn't always mean it's the best option because it's bringing it back to what we're trying to do, what the metrics of those success are and when you need that video to be done by. And if, if it costs you a little bit more to get it done quicker, but you need it to be done quicker and that's most important, then that's what you need to do. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to miss the opportunity. You don't want to miss that window of sort of people wanting to view video, uh, say when a product's released. You don't want to miss that with a new video that takes two months to edit because your editor's been oversubscribed. Yeah, no, Definitely. And I think we've also touched on kind of that. That's kind of your internal team from you know if you're going to engage with a with a video production agency or or do things in house. I think another thing, I guess, from our perspective as the video supplier, the things that that help us, it, it's on the client side, is having all the key stakeholders involved 
ideally at the earliest convenience. Yeah, I mean, if you are in a situation where the approval of a project is very dependent on um, various different senior figures, key stakeholders, without their input earlier on, you very much at the risk of having to make very large wholesale changes further down the line because a certain aspect of the project wasn't considered at that time and then you may end up having to almost start again um so having getting their input certainly at a pre-production stage and getting their sign off on that you're already halfway there to to achieving what they're expecting um i think if you the less involved they are uh, the more surprises there are and, and you may end up a little off track. So just regular input as from them just keeps keeps the project steered in the direction that, that everyone wants to go in and, and will ultimately lead to, to approval. Yeah, definitely. I think what I think what I like of what we do is sort of we build a schedule out so the key stakeholders need know when they, they're needed sort of to sign off things or to feed back on different elements, just so there's not that element of surprise that really takes it away from it. And it's it's important to have a, an effective system in place in in actually giving feedback because you know the phrase "too many cooks in the kitchen" um, comes to mind. But if we've literally got to go through five or six different people all kind of responding and reviewing at their own sort of convenience, that can really sort of push push back um, on uh, the delivery of the final uh, the t- the final product. So. Um, Establishing that earlier on, um, who who the feedback's going to come through, setting up meetings perhaps internally um, beforehand, so that right all stakeholders we're all going to watch the video and collate feedback on this day. Then it's literally one day required, and you can get feedback through and and avoid any holdup. Yeah, I think that's a really good point in sort of making sure that people are bought into the project as well and sort of committed to it. Because if they're not, then they're going to be the ones that are sort of dragging it back. And it's getting them involved as early as possible because one thing we see a lot with video projects is that the main it might be the md or the marketing director or whoever is probably a bit further up the chain of the people that we're sort of liaising with to begin with um they may only sort of come into it a couple of days before because that's when they've got the headspace to look at it and then you know they might not be as interested in in being in those discussions two months before but if you can get them on those calls it would really help because what we see is They'll come in a couple of days before we need to do it, have the headspace for it, and then change everything, <laughs> or be like, "Oh, let's do this," or "Should we do this?" or and then you know that plan is it can you know can almost be be ripped up and started again. Yeah, because they've got the idea of where the business is going. They've got sort of the strategy in their head. A lot of the time, it's sort of it's it's ever changing as well, yeah. and they know what's coming down the line. Whereas sort of people sort of a little bit further down wouldn't have any idea of and sort of wouldn't consider. So sort of having them again, having them involved. And quite often they they are very busy people. So this piece of work, if it's not sort of put in front of them early doors and they're just receiving it, then you know it, it's kind of it's not their fault that they're only just seeing it and they've got a very specific vision for the project. You know, if they weren't sort of asked these questions earlier on, then the only blame really is on you know on the project management, which is what. I believe is a large part of project management is is preempting things and and avoiding any sort of holdups and pitfalls. That, that's the majority of the of the job. So, um, just kind of putting those dates, getting that buy in early on, and making sure that everyone's on the same page as quickly as you can. You, you the, the more work that you put in at the beginning, the actual project running through itself should really just be a result of that planning that you've done before. Yeah, and I think you mentioned getting buy-in, and we were kind of talking about the people, key stakeholders that make the 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 final decision. But it's it's key stakeholders throughout a project as well. So those that might it might be the account manager for that particular client, if they're not bought in, you know, that they can hold things up and it can slow slow a, a, a project down. Or it might well be your client for if you're doing a case study, like if they're not bought in, and you know, we can tell generally speaking, we've got a pretty good knack for it now, whether they're up for it or not from the first call we have and it's always the ones that cancel or something crops up or something in that week before were always without doubt the ones that were not up for it in that first call and you can kind of see it coming so if you can get them bought in 
I've heard a lot of white lies in the past. Yeah, <laughs> COVID was very uh, yeah. COVID friendly. was a great one for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it um, still is. We hear that a bit, a lot less now, but yeah. There's, there's a lot more, there's a lot more leaks, a lot more water. There's a lot, a lot more last minute things seem to happen at the people that weren't up for doing it in the first yeah, definitely, place. Definitely. I think it's very easy as well. Like you're wanting to, I mean, we're probably referring a lot to case studies here, aren't we? So if you're wanting to produce three case studies and you're like, oh, all right, I need, I just need to get three people. Like, Are you up for it? Oh yeah, kind of right. Job done, ticked onto yeah. the next one. When you've not really actually discovered whether they're fully bought in it, it may sort of take that work off your desk back then, but then it'll literally just cause an even bigger headache further down the line when everything else is in place and you've got other people sort of working on the projects and it just holds up everyone. Um, so I think it's important to just take that time and consideration. You mentioned um, cases, but it's also the same for any internal projects you're doing. Of course, Staff, yeah. like, you know, if somebody's not, you know, again, similar thing, you can tell when someone's just not that up for it or maybe doesn't have the right skill sets for it. And getting them involved in a project can, if they're not up for it, slow it down. And if they're not the right skill sets for it, make it any good. I think that probably is where there's a lot of value in sort of bringing in a professional company in because they see it a lot of the time. So they know the way around to navigate those situations or to sort of guide the person who's responsible or guide sort of the, I guess if it's sort of, say, a, a, a brand exec or someone who's not really worked on a project before, sort of having the guidance from a professional company is always really valuable for them. And it can be really tiny things as well, like literally down to the people that you're planning to be in the video on the day, rather than just being like, oh, there's loads of people in the office that day, we'll be able to get someone, and you turn up with your camera or the video crew, and you're like, oh, can we get you for a few shots? But that person may have a lot of deadlines on that day, and, and understandably, if they, they've not heard anything about it before, they can be well within the rights to say, well, no, I've got to do this. And and just making sure the right people are there on the day and and, and planning it with them. Um, it's a lot about setting expectations, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot about course. planning. I think, yeah. I mean, the I mean, the I probably 80% of what we're talking about today is all focused on the start of the project, really, yeah. um, and which kind of takes me on to when you get into the project and how, how integral is it to be sort of communicating regularly as a project team. And by project team, I mean both in terms of your internal team Oh, and both in terms of the video project team as well. Essentially what you're doing is you've done all this preparation and planning early on. It's making sure that that plan is still being followed and you're still on track. Mm. I, I see sort of especially sort of an external video production company as like a, an extension of a team. And so they should be reg regularly communicating with people. You should be communicating with them weekly at the very least. I think if it's sort of like a, a project over sort of a month, six weeks, um, just to keep people up to date as to where you're at. Yeah, it's getting that, that regular call books in with all the right people yeah, involved in the project. Progress, yeah. Updating it, you know, we use, looking at software, you know, we use um, monday.com as our project management tool. It's We're starting to use that a bit more with, with clients and managing updates and things like that. So it's looking at other ways, you know, you can communicate regularly, you know, in person on the phone, but also what are you doing, um, you know, in terms of your software, so to speak, to be communicate effectively as well yeah i think it's especially with bigger projects you need to be able to visually sort of see how it's looking rather than just having it all sort of mapped out in your head and where various things can get forgotten mm -hmm. if you've got it there in a visual medium like a monday.com or whatever sort of crm software that you use you're able to sort of see what notifications are coming up that oh, this thing needs doing by this date and it literally breaks down the project into those little tasks that need doing and it just makes it a hell of a lot easier for you to uh, manage your team manage your, your the resources that you're using um and it's yeah like i say it's just a visual medium in which you can vis visualize the project and make sure that nothing falls by the wayside yeah i think as a project manager knowing exactly where something is at at any given time is sort of really key mm. and sort of it it builds trust with, especially with your project team if they can come to you and say oh what, what's happening with this specific bit and you can say oh here's an update for you like within minutes and that's that's perfect for them we're providing everyone sort of updates what they need to on the, on that software you know you can't always get the answer you want immediately by just sort of ringing someone or emailing someone but if everyone's sort of using that software to to um 
check in with the project. You can literally look and say, all right, he's done this on that date, that needs doing, you know, it, it's a lot easier. It holds people to account, I think, as well, and that's sort of really key, again, sort of having all those key people involved and sort of, like you're saying, knowing who's up for it and knowing who's not. The people who aren't updating it are probably the ones who aren't so up for it or the ones that are too busy and they probably should be either taken off the project or sort of given a bit of a kick to say, like, this is really important, get on with it. Accountability is key as well with any project. Like you say, I think that that gets tracked gets done, and that's you know if 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 it's if a person's responsible for it and it's not being done, it's it's on them, and questions are asked why and when it's going to be done. So it helps to keep keep things done in a, a yeah, I guess kind of a, a streamlined uh, manner. Um, we've covered a lot of good things there. Actually, we're probably um, certainly more focused on the planning side of things. There's probably a bit more we can get into maybe in a future episode in terms of. Um, you know the specifics of sort of project management when you're into it. I think one area I just wanted to kind of finish on before we before we leave was just around um, at the end of the project. It's probably something that we mentioned in probably in every episode, but it is that important, and it's all around getting feedback. Well, it's the way by which you better manage the project next time uh, by learning from this one, um, knowing what you did well, what you didn't, and um, what could be improved. From all sides as well, and it's not just whoever the the customer is, whether they've had a, a good experience. It's it's also, uh, I mean, like w with our clients, we also sort of provide feedback from our side. What would have made it quicker from us for for, for us, and it's, it's some things that literally don't require any extra work as such from the client. It's just they might not be aware that certain things are. It would have been important to get this information at this time rather than it goes both ways. And you know yeah. we've had it before when we might might hear the odd sort of little complaint in the office where someone goes, "Oh, such and such keeps doing this, or they haven't done this," and it's like, "Oh, well, have we have we told them that?" Like, "Oh no, no, I don't don't want to say it to them." Like, but actually, it's better for us and it's better for the client that they know that a particular thing what they are doing is slowing the process down and making it work, making or impacting on quality or what, what, whatever it is. It's having that open dialogue between the both of you to say, well, actually, if you did this, it would make our lives a lot better, a lot easier and we could actually create a better content as a result. I know that when sort of I go into the sort of feedback sessions when I'm having them with clients, sort of having a track of sort of pre-production, production and post and sort of knowing the different points that could have helped having that there is really helpful just to sort of communicate with that that with them so that we have sort of a, a better end product in the next one as well i mean with anything it's quite rare that you get everything absolutely perfect first time and you know the vast majority of of learnings that you have um in any job i think come from making those mistakes those problems arising that you didn't anticipate but you will next time if everyone's kind of debriefed and sort of got it all out into uh, any sort of in the meeting or the the document that you're filling out, um, it's there for for future reference. Yeah, I think we're always looking to improve and sort of having those little key points really helpful for knowing how. Definitely. Yeah, very good. So in true podcast fashion or true cutting room fashion, we end on feedback again, but it just kind of shows how integral it is. Give us any feedback? Then yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, and that goes to you for anyone listening or watching. Feel free to give us some feedback. Um, ideally positive, but you know we are looking to improve. So let us know either way. So yeah, thanks, chaps, for joining me uh, this week in the cutting room. And as ever, we're just going to cover the final seven takeaways for you to take away and action into your business as a result of watching so number one is all around defining what the objective of the project is number two is understanding what the metrics of success looks like number three is to create a plan to achieve those objectives number four is to build the right project team to put that plan into action number five is to understand all the key stakeholders that are involved in the project Number six, have regular communication with that team. And finally, number seven, as ever, is have regular feedback and debriefing sessions at the end of a project. Thanks for joining me, and we look forward to seeing you again in the cutting room.